I want to invite you on an adventure of faith. You don't have to travel any farther than your own living room. Years ago, I was living out in Los Angeles and I bought a new camera and I decided to go out to the desert of all places to give my testimony and drove out to the Salton Sea and I discovered so many new things in the wilderness and what I shared never really saw the light of day until now. I was surprised to learn that Lent is exactly this season when the church traditionally takes 40 days out to fast and repent in preparation for Easter and to release Jesus' experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit and being driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For the 40 days of Lent, we're going to commit ourselves to reading the entire New Testament for 40 days. That breaks down to about five pages a day. It's totally doable. If we found ourselves out in the desert for 40 days being tempted by the devil, what would we say? Jesus had his father's words hidden in his heart. He didn't engage Satan in discussion. He simply spoke from God's word. We're going to attempt to do the same. If we get specific, if we really roll up our sleeves and tear it up, this whole wilderness experience, if we tear it apart, we're going to learn some things. And if we model ourselves after Jesus, we're going to learn a whole lot of things. I want to invite you to come along with me on an adventure, an adventure of ministry, of reading the scriptures, of reading the entire New Testament in 40 days, and talking about it, sharing with others your thoughts, your discoveries, your revelations, sharing with them your encouragements so that they will keep reading and they will discover what you've discovered, that Jesus is Lord, that his word is sacred, and it is a light to our path. I want to start with some scriptures because I think they open the door to something entirely new, something entirely different, something entirely blessed. I'm here right now in New York City and it's raining and that is entirely appropriate. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Zion. Then in Joel 2.23, Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain. And finally, there's this. Give ear, O heaven, and let me speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop like the rain. Let my speech distill like the dew, like raindrops upon tender grass, and like abundant showers upon herbage. That's Deuteronomy 32 verses 1 and 2. Now just imagine that beautiful, beautiful verse, two verses in scripture, and they just vanished. Gone, never to be seen, never to be read. In fact, the entire Pentateuch, the first five books of the, of the Bible, they were lost. And of all places, they were lost inside the temple of God. I'd hate to have those head priests running the show. But I want to talk about that, about the experience in Scripture in 2 Kings, because I, hold, I think it holds the key 
the key to understanding why the word is so precious so amazing so glorious and can transform us but first we need to know it we need to read it we need to digest it we need to think about it mull it over meditate on it talk about it we need to seize it grab a hold and take it and use it learn it because then we're going to have success. We have to be like Hilkiah. It says in scripture in 2 Kings 22, 8, and Hilkiah the high priest said to the Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Israel had misplaced the word of God. I know when I lost my first Bible and I was devastated. I looked all over and I'm sure I, I left it on a park bench or somewhere it slipped out of my bag. All the time I had spent, all the underlying words that were really special for me were gone. And imagine Israel had fallen into such a state under a, an apostate king. An entire generation had no knowledge of, of the word of God. Genesis, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, the whole Pentateuch was lost. And it didn't seem to bother the people because they followed their leader he made sacrifices to the Asherah and to false gods. And he led Israel down that same path. Well, things changed when a new king, king arose. King Hosiah, a righteous king. And he initiated a construction project to, to rehabilitate God's house. It had fallen into complete disrepair. And in the midst of the repair effort, Hilkiah found the word of God. It wasn't in a cave or lost in battle. It was lost in the house of the Lord. Hilkiah found the law and it was eventually read in the presence of King Josiah. And in hearing it, he tore his clothes, repented, and launched a national reformation in Israel. Josiah's reformation included the removal of idols from Israel's life. And when you find God's word, you will be led to remove the idols in your own life. How do we actively place the word of God in the center of our lives? We commit to a Bible reading plan. R.C. Sproul has said, Disciples of Christ abide in his word. Those who abide in his word know the truth and are free. It's time for the entire priesthood of believers to recover the word of God in their lives. The word of God will change you. Prepare for the restoration the reformation of fill in the blank fill in your name so i was just listening to a podcast and i heard somebody talking about when there was a move of god they they were singing some different songs and i came back to church after i'd gone for quite a while and i attended several churches and Every single one, they were singing a song about the 99. And I kept thinking, what is it with this 99 song? And then I eventually listened to the, what the lyrics were all about. And I got the sense that I was the one that Jesus left the 99 for. 
that he came looking for me. And brother, sister, I am glad he did. Because he found me. He didn't have to look far. He didn't have to look far. When you get deeper and deeper into scripture, when you spend more and more time in it, it starts to affect you. You start really thinking about God's will. And he makes his, he makes his will known to you. Years ago, I was out photographing some flowers and I sensed the Holy Spirit telling me to keep going and this is this is weird okay why why would the Holy Spirit ask me to do that but the next day and the next night and for days afterwards and it actually it became years after I photographed those flowers that came up every spring and there was something about it something about it that was a display of obedience I mean it was it was a joy and I came up with some amazing photographs and they'll be used down the road for for ministry I believe but if God can trust you in the small things, then he can give you larger things. You know, uh, the scripture says that, you know, we'll speak to kings and the Holy Spirit. At that time, we don't need to be, uh, what am I gonna say? Because he's gonna give us the words. If we let the Holy Spirit into the smallest minutia of our lives. I bet you, he's gonna bring you before kings a lot sooner than you think. We need to trust in the character and the promises of God and realize that his plan is really unveiled to us, is made clear to us. He says in scripture, for the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And without faith, it is impossible to please him because Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We need to let God get a word in edgewise because his thoughts are more numerous than we could ever even imagine. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And he isn't finished with you yet. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence and we are overcomers overcomers of sin overcomers of temptation overcomers of greater trials little children you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We have to remember 
that we have Jesus on our side. He is the heavy lifter. He shoulders our burdens. There are four techniques, four steps that are really intriguing and really useful. So I, I just ask that you would consider putting that into your toolbox. So you can remember when you're going through scripture and say, I'm gonna try these four different techniques out. I mean, it's worked for centuries, centuries. So your good brothers from the past are sending you a message to the here and now. Practice Lectio Divina, which is called sacred reading. Prayerfully read a passage slowly and repetitively, inviting the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to us through four movements or four stanzas, through reading, through pondering and meditating, through praying, and through living. A guy named John the Cross said this summarizes the four stages. Seek in reading and you will find in meditation. Knock in prayer and it will be open to you in contemplation. First, in examining scripture comes the reading. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. How to? We sit quietly in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to guide our reading. John the Baptist, speaking of Jesus, said, I baptize you with water, but among you stands one who you do not know. Acknowledge God's presence and ask him to guide you. Invite him to come along. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10 says, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So read the text, perhaps several times. I know of many who read the same passage using different translations. The goal is to make the scriptures come alive for us so we can listen, so we can hear. Romans 10, 8 says this, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. The second step is meditation. By treating the, the text as a living word, we ponder a scripture passage, we weigh, we consider, we imagine that we are there, that the words are for us. What do we think about it? If we read the passage, a passage such as, faith comes from hearing. What does that mean? In the past, well, I first heard the word, and there was a scripture that rattled me. Revelations 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and he who opens the door and lets me in, I will come in with him and sup with him and he with me. That's the past. What of the present? The right here, the right now. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. That's Acts 17, 26. And what of the future? What am I going to hear in, down the road in the future that I stand in the crossroads? That I come purposefully before the throne, before 
the throne of God and say, here I am, meet me. In scripture it says, and the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you. Which brings us to prayer. Prayer is a living conversation, a loving conversation. I treasure Psalm 119. And many people who pray the scriptures turn to it frequently. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to thy word. I will not forget your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Which brings us to contemplation. Contemplative prayer and thoughts are hearing the word of God. It is silent love. It isn't the time to give speeches, but to stir the kindling that feeds the fire of his love. In contemplation, we say, come Holy Spirit, come. And in so doing, the Holy Spirit brings his gifts. They're released. And by that I mean the seven gifts spelled out in Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, which is Jesus, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So let's embrace the four movements of Lectio Divina. Remember them, try them, use them. Reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. And I also want to share uh, an encounter that I had where I sensed the anointing of God coming for for one of the first times. So, and I didn't even know what it was. So, I I want to I want to uh, share with you that to encourage conversation and to encourage you to to explore the deep things, the deep things of God that are revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. But the way to go deep is to ask, is to inquire, is to get in the Word, plant ourselves in it, and ask for more. Ask for understanding and wisdom. Oh boy, and it's gonna come. It's gonna come. I, w I had had a great stint in in Montana, and uh, I came back and went to a church out in Studio City, and there was the the music director there was leading the service, and he he prefaced it by saying, "Today I'm gonna talk to you about the anointing," and. I was like, great, what is it? So in all my 45 years of being a Christian, somehow I had missed that sermon. I had no idea what he was talking about. And it got to the end of the service and he said, whoops, we're out of time. So 
we'll have to uh, do it some other time. I was like, I wasn't gonna let that one go. So I went online and I Googled the anointing and a whole bunch of different sermons came up. Well, that weekend, I think I watched 24, 24 videos about the anointing. And one of them was a bunch, well, there were a bunch of them that a guy named, uh, a guy from Singapore named Dr. James Tan spoke about. And he talked about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And as he said those talks, you can find them online, he, 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 he would come every season, every Thanksgiving to the Living Word Church out in Minneapolis. But he would talk about the anointing and how the Holy Spirit could get a hold of you and transform everything about your, your life, your ministry. And by the end of it, I was out in my backyard a couple days later and I was on a, a ladder trimming the hedges. And I'm listening to, to Dr. Tan, James Tan, and, and to a woman from Living Word. And right there on my ladder, right there on my ladder, I prayed for the anointing. And I have to tell you, it came down. It came down. And I was really pleased when I went to church soon thereafter. And the lead minister said, I, I want everybody to lay hands on everyone else because I want to send you out. And I, all, I want you all to be anointed. I raised my hand, touching somebody else as well. And the power of God really did descend. And so now I'm here, <laughs> troubling you telling you that there is a blessing waiting for you. There is an anointing waiting for you. And so let's, let's explore it. Let's step into it. Let's ask about it. And let's delve into it.